Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. So before I get into today's video, before I get into the case, I do have to give a huge thank you, a huge shout out to today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by June's Journey. June's Journey is a game, it is an app that you can download for free. It is a hidden object murder mystery game that is set in the 1920s. The scenes and illustrations in this game are just beautiful. You get to indulge in a little bit of the glamour of the 1920s. Each scene you go through, you get closer to solving the mystery. The game revolves around June Parker, who is on a quest to find out who murdered her sister, and along the way she uncovers tons of family secrets. The storyline is simply captivating and there's tons of twists and cliffhangers. It's a game you could just play in your free time while you're relaxing, but trust me, you're going to get a little bit hooked. It's also one of those games that gets your brain working, which of course is always good. I do go through phases when it comes to games and I'll kind of drift through different games and whatever I'm kind of in the mood for, but I can tell this is going to be a game that I'm going to play for quite a while. I'm always going to come back to because I've just been obsessed with it lately. I will have all the information regarding this game linked down in the description for you guys to check out. Definitely go check it out. Let me know what you think down below in the comments. Let me know if you've ever played this game. And with all that being said, let's just get into the video. Now, if you're a subscriber of mine and you've watched a decent amount of videos, you might know that I have a series on my channel called Identified Does, and that series has to do with Jane and John Does that have been identified, but their case might still remain unsolved. Some of them are solved, some of them are still unsolved. Now, this is the first video on my channel that I've done of a Jane or John Doe that their identity is still unknown. This is the case of Little Miss Nobody, which I'm sure many of you guys are going to agree. This is probably one of the saddest names given to a John or Jane Doe, and I'm sure at the time it wasn't meant to be taken that way, but it's just a very sad name for anybody. A lot happened in the year 1960 from the first ever star being placed on the Hollywood Walk of Fame to the first ever televised debate to the airing of the show The Flintstones. 1960 was also the year that the body of a small child would be found. This child's identity is still unknown and this case still remains unsolved. On July 31st, 1960, a Las Vegas school teacher named Russell Allen was searching along Sand Wash Creek bed on Old Alamo Road in Congress, Arizona. Congress is a census-designated place in Yavapai County. He was looking for rocks to decorate his garden, but stumbled upon a site he'd never forget. He found the partially buried body of a young girl. She was buried sitting up with her arms stretched outwards. There were very prominent disturbances in the sand near where she was buried, so it looks like the person responsible for burying her attempted in two other locations nearby. After 58 years, almost six decades, in 2018, which was last year, there was finally a facial reconstruction photo done of this child. Thanks to the people at the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification, we now have an idea of what she may have looked like. She was Caucasian. She died around two weeks prior to her remains being found. Her cause of death was unknown because of the extreme state of decomposition her body was in but it was ruled a homicide. Due to the decomposition as well, they were unable at the time to do a composite sketch of what she may have looked like. She had no broken bones, but the contemporary report of her autopsy states she may have been in a fire before or after her death because her body was charred in some areas. She was somewhere between three feet, six inches to four feet, five inches tall. She had brown hair that had maybe been dyed auburn and her fingernails and toenails were painted red. She was found wearing white or light pink shorts and a checkered top with a chain pattern on it. On her feet, she wore a pair of adult men's sandals that had been cut down to fit her and they were fastened with leather straps. When it comes to her age, the original autopsy report stated that she was probably between five to seven years old. Later reports came out saying that she was probably between three to six. Now she did have all of her baby teeth. They were all perfectly fine. None of them had fallen out yet. And also based on her height, I would say she was probably four or five years old. I know that most children's baby teeth fall out when they're about five to six. so. 
Let me know what you think, but I would take a guess and say she was either four or five. The Yavapai Police Department worked tirelessly on the case, trying their hardest to find out who this little girl was who had her life tragically cut short. There was help from local media and private citizens. The case was broadcast across all sheriff radio and teletype networks. Some people like Sheriff Jim Cramer and Deputy County Attorney George Ireland traveled hundreds of miles during their investigation in an attempt to piece together what they could. Hundreds of calls and letters came into the police station. I mean, they were flooded, but none of these leads sounded promising. None of them really went anywhere. But in late of August of that year, they thought for a small bit of time, they might have figured out her identity. They started to suspect the little girl found, eventually coined the name Little Miss Nobody, was Sharon Lee Galagos. Little Sharon was abducted on July 21st, 1960, behind her family home in Alamogordo, New Mexico. July 21st, the day she was abducted, to the day the Jane Doe was found on July 31st, would have been 10 days, almost two weeks, which would make sense. But after further looking into the theory, police stated their Jane Doe was definitely older than Sharon. Sharon Lee Galagos still remains missing to this day. Then police thought that maybe their Jane Doe belonged to a family that traveled around a lot, maybe only stayed in areas for a short period of time, doing odd jobs to make enough money to move around more. They questioned a Mr. Lester Davidson and two of his four children for hours on end. This was a family who was from New Mexico originally who were hitchhiking in Yavapai during July of 1960. In the end, police stated the family did not have any connection to their case or the disappearance of Sharon Lee Galagos. From what I read online, the police found a few other things near her body, like a supposed bloody knife. Now, they did say that she wasn't stabbed, so this bloody knife may have not had anything to do with her case, even though it is a bit suspicious, and they also found a footprint. They sent the knife, the footprint, and the child's clothes to the lab for further testing. On August 10th, 1960, she was laid to rest in Mountain View Cemetery. She was originally going to be laid to rest in a pauper's grave, but with the help from a fundraiser by a local radio announcer named David Paladin, she was able to have a proper burial. She was buried in a light blue casket that read, God's Little Child, date of birth, unknown, date of death, unknown. Around 70 people attended her funeral, none of them actually knowing this child, but they all felt like they did know her because they invested so much time into this case and trying to find out who she was. You have to think how insanely sad that is that this child obviously in her life while she was alive loved people and none of those people were there to mourn her. So she was laid to rest, but this case wasn't just yet. Then in March of 1961, they thought that they may have figured out her identity again, and they thought that she could have possibly been Debbie Dudley, who was a four-year-old missing from Virginia. When it comes to Debbie's case, it is a little bit more tragic than her just being missing. Debbie Dudley and three of her other siblings were still missing after her seven-year-old sister was found dead on February 9th, 1961, wrapped in a blanket. Her cause of death was malnutrition, exposure, and neglect at the hands of her parents. Yavapai County's Jane Doe was not Debbie Dudley because Debbie's remains were later found in South Virginia. Debbie Dudley's parents were later charged with the murder of five of their ten children who they all starved, they neglected, and these five children ended up dying horrible deaths and the parents disposed of their bodies in five different locations. On August 8, 1961, Sheriff Kramer led a group of officers and a camera crew to the location where the child's body was found. Sheriff Kramer and attorney George Ireland presented the child's sandal and Kramer stated, somewhere there is someone who has the answer that we have been looking for. Maybe this will be the thing that will bring that person forward. The footage was later broadcast and police were sure that something would come of this, but nothing ever did. Yet. Now, that was 1961 that they did that broadcast and 57 years later, the Yavapai police decided to reopen her case, dig up her body and do a facial reconstruction photo of her. Her remains were found in a sand wash in 1960, but no one knew who she was. The local community raised money to pay for a proper burial and funeral service at the time. Recently, the local sheriff's office decided new tools could help ID the girl. 
They reached out to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Now with this photo to go on, they are once again hoping to give Little Miss Nobody a real name. Her DNA had been entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Person System and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Like in many cases, they figured with the advancements in technology that they would give it another shot and something could possibly come of it and they just want to give her her name back. Now when it comes to the bloody knife and the footprint and her clothes that were sent to the lab for testing, I could not find any shred of information online anywhere about what those tests said, but I'm guessing since in current time they're going over everything again, we'll probably have more information when it comes to that. If you have any information regarding the case, you are urged to phone either Investigator John Shannon at 928-777-7293 or leave an anonymous tip by calling the Yavapai Silent Witness at one 800 932 3232. Like the sheriff's office said, any detail, no matter how small, is important in the quest to determine this child's identity. Little Miss Nobody is somebody. So in the next part of this video, I kind of just want to do a little chit chat with you guys, go over a few of my personal thoughts that I'm sure many of you guys are thinking as well. Just some information that leaves you with a little bit of concern, a few questions, and go over a few theories. The thing personally that really sticks out to me in this case, besides maybe the bloody knife and the footprint and those bits of information, are the fact that her hair was dyed and she had her toenails and her fingernails painted a bright red color. Now I was looking online and a lot of people on Reddit who were alive back then, whether they were children or adults in the 1960s, all pretty much agreed that dyeing a child's hair or painting their nails was very uncommon back then. A lot of people brought up the idea that maybe she was abducted and her abductor wanted to change her appearance in some way, kind of alter it a little bit so anyone who was on the search for her or knew that she was missing wouldn't be able to identify her. There were also some people that said that maybe her abductor had some very sick intentions and wanted to paint her nails and dye her hair to make her appear older for obvious disgusting reasons. It's very odd to me, and let me know your opinion, the fact that she had her hair dyed and her nails painted, but her shoes were men's sandals that were cut down to fit her. So if this was her family that dyed her hair and painted her nails, how did they afford hair dye and nail polish but not sandals to fit their child? I just, I do not believe for one second that it was her parents who dyed her hair and changed her nail color. There was one person on Reddit that brought up the idea that maybe she was a child performer in Las Vegas because Las Vegas was not that far away, but that also doesn't make sense to some people who responded because if there was a performer in Las Vegas, especially a child that went missing, there would be some sort of report out that they were missing a child. So I definitely don't think that's the case. There was another theory that was brought up that I have to discuss because it did catch my attention, and that was that maybe she was in the country and her parents were not legal citizens yet, and they didn't report her missing because they didn't want to contact authorities and be deported back to their country, which is so sad to think about, but that could be a possibility of why there were no missing children reported in the area that fit her description. Another thing is the fact that she was partially buried, which sounds very strange, but like I said, the person made two other attempts near her body, and this was Arizona. It was in summer, very dry soil, so the fact that they couldn't dig that deep isn't very odd. I think whoever took her life and partially buried her in this location honestly just didn't care much about the situation. They didn't really think it through. I feel like it was kind of a last minute thing to just get rid of her body, as horrible as that sounds. I think they figured that she would be found eventually, but due to the climate and the weather conditions in Arizona, they figured that she would decompose very quickly. This was of course before a time with DNA testing so they didn't really have to worry about that but I hope with the advancements in technology we can find out something more in current time. 
Possibly her family was not from the area. Maybe she was abducted from a different area and the family lived there, didn't have much money, didn't own a radio or television, so they couldn't hear that their daughter's disappearance stemmed into this huge mystery. I do apologize for there not being a lot of information when it comes to this case. I tried to gather as much as I could. There's just not a lot out there, but I did want to discuss it because it was recently reopened in 2018. There are a lot of questions when it comes to this case. Many of those questions we may never know the answers to, but I hope since this case was recently reopened, we may have some of those answers very soon. There is a Facebook page for this Jane Doe. I will link it down below in the description. If you are interested in keeping up with this case, any new updates will be put on that Facebook page, so definitely make sure to go follow that. Also, if you want to know anything else about this case, I will put all my sources down below in the description as well. I, of course, like always, want to hear your opinions, so put those down below in the comments. If you're not already, make sure to subscribe to my channel, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye, guys.